what is the most critical part of writing exposition, or rather, good exposition? We will be exploring the answer by examining Chips, Tom Hardy, and Stephen Knight's Taboo. Taboo is the brainchild and passion project of Tom and Chips Hardy, released in 2017 on BBC and FX. It follows the antics of James Delaney, played by Tom Hardy, in 1814 London, a time when England and America were at war. When I first started this series, I first wondered to myself, why was this show called Taboo? One thing Africa did not cure is that I still love you. Huh. Before I dive deep into writing exposition and answering the main question, bear with me just a little bit as I quickly discuss the show's themes, because it's all going to tie nicely together at the end. The word taboo refers to culturally prohibiting an act or discussion of particular practices or ideas. The subjects may be deemed sensitive or sacred or outright repugnant. The series doesn't shy away from a lot of these subjects. At its surface, the title is a reflection of how the show explores the forbidden, ergo the term taboo. Hardy portrays a main character who has committed acts of incest, cannibalism, witchcraft, practices that are socially deviant in their own right, but then are magnified under the scrutinous lens of a pre-Victorian society. Where many films and authors choose to portray the late romantic and pre-Victorian era through a golden age lens, think Jane Austen or Thomas Hardy, no relation, Taboo goes counter to these expectations and chooses to focus on the darker, neglected parts of history for inspiration. If you look at the morality of 1814 when Taboo is set, it's much more hedonistic and libertarian than the 1960s. Before the Victorian era, England was much more of a wild place. The key is in finding individuals who will give you a good sense of history. For example, we have an American spy in Taboo in later episodes who's based on a real person. He was a spy and also a surgeon at St. Bart's. We used the whole thing because it was so weird. Thus, the term taboo doesn't just reflect the actions of the main character and anti-hero James Delaney, it's more. The show is an inside look at all the taboos of a society, so to speak. It lets us dive deep into a London shrouded in dark secrets, rumors, and corruption. James Delaney has to navigate through it all, the illicit dealings of the East India Trading Company and the Crown, the espionage of the Americans, and even the immoral citizens of London as they try to ravage the remnants of his father's legacy. Everybody has something to hide, and because of that, people get hurt. You do realize this whole business is about revenge. And why would James Delaney hate the India, sir? What the hell did you do to him, Stuart? So now, what about exposition? The thing about this show is, as the audience, we begin the show by knowing incredibly little about everyone and everything that is going on. Funny enough, there's very little exposition, and this is more or less by design. It's a result of the writer Stephen Knight's process. Stephen Knight has an unusual method when he begins writing a story, and that is, he kind of ignores structure. If it's an original idea, I find it's much nicer to just start writing, read it back, and then think about what's going on. <coughs> and in the end, you write, it's, it's not very economical, because you write a lot of stuff and then afterwards impose some sort of structure on it. But the whole three-act thing, I don't know. As a writer, this means Stephen Knight doesn't always know where he's going, or where he's coming from, or really where the next beats of the story will be. In an interview with Collider, Stephen Knight says, the way I tend to work, which isn't necessarily the most economic in terms of time, is to have the central character and just send him off to do something. I don't even know what he's about to do when I do that. An example is having him walk along the foreshore, because you know that's going to look great, and then somebody comes up to him, but you genuinely don't know who that is, and then they have a conversation, and from that conversation you find something out. The dog's here live off the flesh from suicides. Never known one go tamely to a man's hand. I know it sounds weird, but that leads the plot and takes you in another direction. So really, the reason why we, the audience, know incredibly little about what's going on at the beginning is because Knight also doesn't really know either. Knight's method gives him a creative freedom to add twists and turns to a story how he likes, but it also helps him create exposition. In the book Story by Robert McKee, he makes some crucial points on what encompasses well-written exposition. 
One of the key ideas he brings up is using exposition as ammunition. Your characters know their world, their history, each other, and themselves. Let them use what they know as ammunition in their struggle to get what they want. And we can see how this principle applies to the scene we just saw. The piece of exposition that is revealed is this. You think your father's kid feeds himself? James's father Horace has a bastard child, so how does Ebitson weaponize this piece of exposition to get what he wants? My wife have looked after that boy for 10 years with not one penny from you. Now you're back. I want payment. He reveals that James is indebted to him. Among the many pieces of info that are revealed in this scene, it also reveals how people perceive James and his family. Ebitson speaks to Delaney's witchcraft he picked up while in Africa, and the fact that James is a liar like his father. The thing is, since we know very little about James from the very start, he could have a number of things that creep up from the past that implicate him. Robert McKee also says this, You do not keep the audience's interest by giving it information, but by withholding information, except that which is absolutely necessary for comprehension. And with Stephen Knight, he withholds everything from the start. I always think if the opening's got to really explode and ask lots of questions, and you've just got to keep pulling the rug out from under people's expectations. He makes the audience engage the story by asking questions, and he controls what questions the audience asks because, as we've learned, it's the same questions he's asking. In the beginning of the show, I found myself asking, where is he going, and why, a lot. Where is James off to? Oh, he's returning home. Who's there? This pistol is loaded. Why is James still around in this scene? Oh, he's had an incestuous relationship with a sister in the past who now has a controlling, oppressive husband. Short of two shillings, please do not hesitate to ask. The few pieces we get of James's backstory are told through his action. We start off with backstory, but I think the backstory comes bit by bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as you write the characters, the scenes happen, then I think you, you start to think of a reason why they might behave like that and why they might be like that. Um, and then by the end, you've sort of almost got a complete backstory for mm -hmm. that character. But along the way, I wouldn't fill in the gaps too, too much before getting to the end. Mm -hmm. It's almost a double-edged sword the way Stephen Knight has written this character because in the beginning we don't always understand James's motivation because not enough is revealed to us. But James Delaney is a fairly interesting enough character and Tom Hardy does a great job with him long enough until that information and motivation is revealed. James, of course, is not the only character with skeletons in his closet. Along the way we learn more about his sister, Brace, Godfrey, the Americans, and many others. These are characters who have their own dark secrets that are now at risk of being exposed because James Delaney is back. And the one who is the most at risk? Sir Stuart Strange, head of the East India Company. But unlike most of the secrets we learn, this one isn't revealed until quite a bit later on in the season. At the end of episode 5, in fact. Involved in an illicit shipment of slaves for personal profit, were complicit in the deaths of those slaves and in the subsequent concealment of the facts. And you believe that those men are senior directors within the Honorable East India Company. And there's good reason for this too. Robert McKee states that the wise writer therefore obeys the first principle of temporal art. Save the best for last. For if we reveal too much too soon, the audience will see the climaxes coming long before they arrive. If Strange's evil deeds were revealed at the beginning of the series, it would have been pointless and irrelevant. But now, in the height of the series' conflict, this piece of exposition is being weaponized as ammunition against Strange. Up until now, we've only received small hints of what has happened. The records show he was once in your own regiment. <laughs> and I do know the evil that you do, because I was once part of it. <laughs> The East India don't deal slaves. No, no, they don't. But they do run cloth and trade beads to Tangiers, and then slaves to Trinidad. And yet we still have a lot of questions left open-ended, leaving room for the big reveal at the end of the series. They serve good hock to traitors. Perhaps you will be served the same. <laughs> <laughs> Strange admits his guilt by dropping the charges on James. They will be dropped before midday.
There's this recurring element in Taboo that has to do with characters obsessing about their image and how they are perceived by others. You make the Americans red. You make them red. It's us who should be red. We wear red. James Delaney is laughing at us. The crown, Coop, the prince, all sniggering at us. As loyal subjects of the crown, we feel it is our duty to expose disloyalty and treason in time of war. Yeah, that's totally not a lie. This recurring element in the show invites an interplay between the different parties to exploit each other for personal gain, all of it creating a concoction for conflict. And in return, you would sell out the East India. I'll settle your dispute with the king regarding Bombay and we can talk. The crown will protect her from the company and the company will protect her from the crown. However, unlike the rest, James appears to be the only character that doesn't care about how people perceive him. The rumors about him spread, and he often doesn't interject. Did you really eat flesh? Why don't you tell your friends that you're sick, and you can come and hear everything? It works well because we realize the whole of James's backstory isn't really that important. Chips Hardy said it best in an article from iNews. The key to it is how do you leave behind the person you once were? We all change as the years go on, so does the world still have to see you as you were when you were 18? The great thing about someone like Delaney is that he has a past, an undefined present, and God knows what's coming in the future. I think we have an inherent sympathy for people in transit. It's his actions in the present story that become important. The only thing we need to know is that he is not the same man he once was. Everything else has been and will be slowly revealed bit by bit. So what is the most critical part of writing exposition? Well, we've been talking about it this whole time, but let's refer back to Robert McKee. He says, What are the critical pieces of exposition? Secrets. The painful truths characters do not want known. Thanks for watching. Hi everyone. So new format for the videos. Let me know what you think. I'm always experimenting with things like this and your feedback is incredibly valuable. Um, so yeah, I've been asked to watch Taboo by many of you for quite some time now and uh, I'm really glad I did. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, can't wait for the second season. Uh, there are still a few things in the first season of course that leave a little to be desired. Some of the hallucination scenes are a little, um, they kind of lead nowhere so I hope that's rectified. Um, anyways, thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing. Uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon, because if, if you do, that will help me immensely in putting out these videos. Um, and yeah, just thanks once again. Uh, that's all I have. I'll catch you all in the next one. Cheers.